Hello, I'm, I'm Gabriel Sanchez. I'm the interim director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Center for Health Policy. I think I know most of you here, so a brief, quick overview. The RWJ Center here at UNM specifically focuses on racial and ethnic health disparities, which is a topic you'll see our speaker uh, this afternoon will get into. And our primary mission is to train the next generation of health policy leaders. You see many of our PhD students, they come across many different disciplines, but are all anchored around trying to utilize a social determinants of health framework to really improve health policy outcomes, particularly for underserved populations. Uh, thank you all for bearing the weather. I know you all are probably like me checking to see if they're going to close out the institution. Uh, it's, it's a shame that the weather hit on what, what I've really been of all our speaker series this semester. This is the last one, the one I was most excited to see, largely because I perceive this talk dovetails with a lot of the research interests of a lot of our, our PhD students and our faculty. So those of you that are here, I know you're in for a particular treat. Uh, Dr. Bridget Goosby, as you see from her bio that's been sent around on campus, is a recently tenured associate professor of sociology at the University of Nebraska. Congratulations on the recent note on tenure. Yeah, give her a round of applause. That's not an easy thing to, easy thing to do. If you, if you haven't seen her bio, her, her PhD is from Penn State University. She's also done a postdoc, a two-year postdoc at the University of Michigan. So obviously has been well trained. Um, comes from somewhat of an interdisciplinary background, both sociological as well as demography. We had a, a good conversation yesterday evening, so I got a chance to hear about the training that, that she has in her background that I think leads to the great research that you'll hear about today. And I think the, the framework that I'd like to, to, to kind of contextualize this is really thinking heavily and theoretically about this notion of discrimination and its implications for health outcomes, which again is somewhat the bread and butter of the RWJ Center are here, which is why it's a real pleasure to introduce you, and I'll get out of the way and let you do your thing. But it's a real pleasure. I hope this isn't the last opportunity we have to hear from you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Gabe, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to come out here to such a vibrant and diverse scholarly environment here at the University of New Mexico and the RWJ Center. Um, it's been, I don't actually have an affiliation myself with RWJ, but my spouse was a postdoc in the RWJ Health and Society Scholars Program at the University of Michigan while I was a postdoc in, IC, in ISR in the Program for Research on Black Americans. And so um, I've had the pleasure of working with and being around a lot of exceptional scholars in, uh, affiliated with RWJ. And so I'll try not to disappoint you guys here um, when I give this talk. And so um, I think that what's really important today is this is a topic that is really close to my heart, but it's one that I fairly recently came to. I talked to some of the graduate students earlier today um, about this. And so I transitioned into this work out of doing poverty-related research and became really interested in understanding the interactions between mental and physical health. But then, as I increasingly became more interested Yeah. I'm loud. I'm sure y'all can hear me. Yeah? I think you're good, but just check. Okay. Well, just let me know if you can't hear me. Like, raise a hand or something. Let me know if you can't hear me. But I like to wander, so. <laughs> um, all right. So I want to go ahead and get started in talking about the implications, particularly of racial discrimination, um, on the implications for the persistent, uh, persistence of racial disparities in health. And so to start, I wanted to start off with a quote from Dr. David Williams, who's a sociologist at Harvard University. This was his ASA, American Sociological Association, Leo Reader Award um, speech. And what he says here is that racial disparities in health are a stark symbol of the historic and ongoing racial inequalities in society. They reflect the enduring effects of the institutionalization of inequality for stigmatized groups. They are a potent reminder of the many miles that we still need to journey to achieve equality. Um, and this takes on a particular level of, a of urgency in terms of the importance of understanding how inequality is related to health. Because one of the things that is happening is this increase and escalation in racial um, kind of racial animosity um, in our society. And what's important about this is this is from a structural level down to a micro interactional level. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the long term implications of that and what that means for people's subsequent health outcomes. 
because the process through which people experience unfair treatment and inequality and just discriminatory interactions, this can take a tremendous toll on people's health. And so I want to walk you through kind of the implications of the tolls that this can take on health. And I think that stress is a, one of the mechanisms through which we see these poor health outcomes manifest. And so I draw upon, in terms of the theoretical framework that I'm interested in, one of the um, theories that I've drawn upon is the late Rodney Clark and colleagues' theory of the biopsychosocial model of racism as a stressor. And so when we talk about racism and racial discrimination, we know racism is basically the ideas and the aggression and behaviors that people experience or engage in that's related to the subordination of a certain group of people um, that can lead to, ultimately, that's about these stereotypes about different racial and ethnic membership to physiological stress responses. So what this means is that from the structural level, right, um, the process or the consequences of experiencing unfair treatment, access to jobs or limited access to jobs, um, having being treated unfairly in the classroom, uh, all of these different things in addition to the kind of microaggressions, right? So these are nonviolent, aggressive interactions that people have that are based on racist attitudes and ideology. These sorts of things from the micro to the to macro to the micro level can lead to people responding physiologically, biologically um, to these um, types of situations, they're considered stressful. And so what this means is that this physiological spot response to stress, um, this can ultimately lead to vulnerability to stress-related illnesses. And so I'm going to talk a little bit to you about what kinds of illnesses that um, we mean by stress-related illnesses, because I would argue that while access to health care and quality of health care is one part of the picture as to why people of different race ethnic groups experience differential health outcomes, unfair treatment, racial discrimination specifically um, works um, as a potential proximate determinant of poor health outcomes for minority group members um, through this whole pathway of discrimination to physiological stress response to stress related illness. And so before I get into um, the meat and potatoes of the talk, I really want to give you just a basic walkthrough of the kind of, of the biology of stress, right? Because the human body um, evolutionarily has been devised to respond to acute levels of stress, not chronic levels of stress. These are two different things, right? So when we're talking about acute stress, um, I like to use the example that comes from one of my favorite books, um, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. It's the book about the biology of stress. Um, is if our ancestors were out on the savanna um, and they're wandering around, if they get chased by a lion, they have a physiological response to that. It's called our fight, fight or flight response. Um, and so what this means is that the human body actually is set up to adapt to these stressful responses by the body having these systematic changes in it that respond to that momentary, la um, that momentary stressor, right? And so our body's adaptation to stressful responses is actually very, very helpful in the short term. But in the long term, this can be incredibly damaging um, to the human body. And so there are specific systems that I want to go through really quickly before I start giving you the findings from my talk, I mean from my um, pilot, um, that are associated with chronic illnesses. So the first is the vas vascular system. And so again, if we talk about, if we think about this um, idea of a lion on the savanna, you're on, they're on the savanna hunting and a lion comes out and is about to attack you. One of two things can happen. You can stay and try to fight that lion, or you can run. I would run. Um, what this means, though, <laughs> is that your body ramps up for that, right? And so from a vascular system perspective, what this means is that you end up having an increase in your blood pressure and your heart rate because your body is trying to bring in as much oxygen and as much energy as possible so that you can bolt. Um, but what this also means is that, so as your heart is pumping faster, your veins start to become more rigid, um, you've got dilation in your arteries. All of these things in the short term are fine because you need that so that you can function at a, at a level of stress, right, so that you can get away quickly. What this means in the long term, though, is that this can be really damaging to the body if you're experiencing over an extended period of time this kind of low-grade 
chronic stress level that we experience in our day-to-day -day lives potentially that can lead to damage to the arteries. Um, this can lead to the heart. The heart is a muscle that wears out. Um, if you have high blood pressure, so escalations in that and the blood pumping through your system is what we call high blood pressure. Chronic high blood pressure is what we call hypertension. So in the process of experiencing stress chronically, if over a period of time your body does not stop um, having this vascular ramp up, this can ultimately end up leading to hypertension, which subsequently is one of the first steps to cardiovascular disease, which is one of the major killers um, of people in the United States. And so this is, complete, this is incredibly detrimental in, that, in terms of the perspective of chronic stress, right? So that's the vascular system. So the endocrine system is the next system that works kind of in synergistically um, among these three systems. And the endocrine system is responsible for um, the release of hormones throughout the body. And the hormones are the thing that go through your bloodstream that send different messages and signals throughout your body um, to secrete other hormones that are related to different systems in the body. Now, the one that I, part of the endocrine system that I want to focus on is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or the HPA axis for short. Um, the HPA axis is this interaction between the hypothalamus, um, which is in the brain, with the pituitary gland, which this interaction between these, when we are talking about people experiencing stress, releases this um, messenger, ACTH, the adrenal glands, which are on top of the kidneys, and they release different hormones that are responsible for different jobs in the body. Now, the hormone that I'm most interested in today is a glucocorticoid adrenal hormone called cortisol. Cortisol is responsible for a lot of different stuff. So it is responsible for people's mood, sleep patterns, energy storage and usage. Um, it's related to um, fat storage. So it has a lot of different responsibilities, right? And so levels of cortisol in the system, they go in a diurnal pattern, um, an expected diurnal pattern over the course of the day. Um, and having cortisol in the system what it does, and it's actually is um, these messages when they're sent, when people are chronically, um, when people are acutely stressed, so like when this lion is stalking you and you realize it and you run, the first thing that, ha one of the things that happens along with this increase in heart rate is that this messenger pattern that goes through the HPA axis leads to cortisol, increases in cortisol in your system. What cortisol then does is creates a message telling the body to secrete more blood sugar into the system. So you have more blood, um, blood sugar or glucose running through your system. Um, it also tells insulin, which is a hormone um, that tells the body to uptake sugar out of, the, um, out of the blood from eating, from the food that you eat, into cells for energy, right? Because this is part of our metabolism, the conversion of energy. Um, it tells insulin to stop taking up sugar Sugar, and then creates more sugar, which is called glucogenesis. And so this leads to you have a ton of energy in your bloodstream. And so at a, an acute level, this is great because then you're burning off a whole bunch of energy as you're running or you're fighting or whatever the case may be. Now, if you're acutely stressed, um, if you're experiencing something over an extended period of time that's stressing you out over the course of the day or course of weeks, um, you're going to end up with blunted responses. So it means that over the course of an extended period of time, you're going to have a lot more sugar gunking up your system. Um, you're going to have a lot more blood sugar running around in, um, in your bloodstream. It also means that insulin response is going to be blunted. That means that you can't have as much sugar um, being taken up by cells. It's just sitting there in your system. This is what we call the precursor to type 2 diabetes, which is insulin resistance. This means that your body becomes resistant to the message of insulin taking up sugar out of your cells. And this is really harmful. And so while chronic stress might not necessarily be causing diabetes, it's actually one of the things that increases severity of it. And if you're obese and you're insulin resistant, you're much more likely to um, experience type 2 diabetes. All right, so this is a really important um, kind of stress-related illness that's associated with the endocrine system. And finally, the immune system is particularly salient um, when we're dealing with stress. And so at an, in an acute response to the immune system, so I like this little picture here because these are little messengers in the body that are looking around, making sure that there aren't harmful and noxious diseases and infections going through the body. And they're telling, um, you know, they're sending out these messages all the time. So when you're experiencing immune dysfunction when related to um, 
acute stress or chronic stress, this can be harmful. Now, when you're acutely stressed or when you have this moment of stress, in the first minute, your, um, your immune system actually ramps up. So you have more inflammation, you have more inflammatory cells going through your system, you have more antibodies. There's an increase for a moment, right? So you have this increase in escalation in immune function. But what happens after the first hour of that is you get a drop in your immune system function. So that's what we call suppression. And so once you have this drop in immunity, that means that you're gonna be vulnerable to illnesses. You can be vulnerable to colds, you'll be vulnerable to infections, things of that nature. So, but if this goes on for a longer period of time, the longer that this goes on, the more likely you are to have immune dysfunction. And that means that you're gonna be more likely to have slower wound healing and things of that nature. Um, you're also gonna be more likely, as you have these chronic stress um, reactions, the immune system has a basal level that it needs to go back to. But if you experience this increase and then a drop as you're stressed out, it means that you bottom out and then you go back up again. And the more you experience that over an extended period of time, the more the reactivity becomes blunted and you don't ever get back down to the ideal basal level. And that means that you start moving up into the autoimmune function problems. This means that you become more vulnerable to diseases like um, asthma, um, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, things of that nature that are inflammatory. And so these are the three systems that are really major players when we're talking about chronic stress um, and also when we're talking about stress-related illness. So what does this mean for health disparities and how we think about the role of discrimination in health? Well, if we look at patterns of health, and um, I, as, even though I'm specifically focusing on African Americans today, there are gonna be moments when I'm talking about this as l having larger implications um, for racial and ethnic minorities more generally. Um, if we look at, for example, a, a stress-related illness of hypertension, African Americans have higher rates of hypertension than other race and ethnic groups. I should also know African Americans also have high rates of functional impairment, particularly among um, women. Um, also important to note is that coronary heart disease, the death from coronary heart disease, African Americans have the highest rates of mortality from it. So again, it's not just about the onset of illness, it's about the severity of it as well. And so when you're chronically stressed, the onset of illness comes on, but this also means the severity of it can also be exacerbated. Um, here we have diabetes rates, um, and so, thank you. Strat this is stratified by males and females, and so African-American males and females also have the highest rates of diabetes um, to date. And so there are these traditional, I call this a traditional model. This comes out of demographic um, research. This is Doug Massey out of Princeton, his biosocial model of racial stratification, um, which is about the consequences of these traditional ideas of socioeconomic inequality and residential segregation as having these consequences for um, high allostatic load, which is uh, the wear and tear on the human body um, that's related to these uh, illnesses here. He argues that racial stratification, the structural stratification, um, is through this pathway of poverty, concentration, and violence, what has most, the most consequences for health outcomes. And inherent in this particular model, he would argue that we have racial inequality as kind of, that. That's just a given in here, right? Because as people structurally, Af African Americans in particular and other groups, have been residentially segregated, which leads to this concentration of poverty. However, I would argue that it's a little more nuanced argument than that because I think that when we look at patterns of racial and ethnic, dis um, patterns of illness, um, particularly among African Americans in the middle class, um, African Americans are showing incredibly high rates of illness compared to um, other middle class groups. And so that that would, I would argue that it's much more complicated than just a socioeconomic status story um, and that segregation part of the story. And so because of these kinds of thinking about these models in terms of racial and ethnic discrimination in health, I really wanted to dig in more deeply into what the implications are in families um, and what this means for the long-term health outcomes for people as they experience discrimination. So one of the things that I've done with the research that I have right now was I, um, well actually before I get into that, I should say that there has been a growing and increasingly growing literature on discrimination in health. 
And so this discrimination um, literature is actually beginning to show that this is across different race ethnic groups. This is American Indians, this is Mexican Americans, African Americans, that there are these different harmful outcomes of experiencing discrimination specifically, not um, just looking at kind of structural patterns, but also just the experience of saying, I've been discriminated against. They're associated with cardiovascular disease function, an example being African American women um, who reported experiencing discrimination um, in, in, a certain, in a study that I looked at have higher um, arterial thickening, right? So thickening of arterial walls, which is associated with cardiovascular disease. Um, abdominal obesity and weight gain um, is associated with discrimination or the experiences of discrimination. Now, this is important because abdominal obesity um, in the midsection is really, um, that is associated with cardiovascular disease risk. Um, insulin resistance also associated with the experiences of discrimination, preterm and low birth weight births. So women who experience discrimination while pregnant are much more likely to have preterm births or low birth weight and or low, low birth weight births. Um, this is also associated with self-rated health and depressive symptoms. So with all of this evidence, accumulating about discrimination. This is why I wanted to really start digging into what the patterns are within families and what the implications are for people ex who experience these kinds of situations. And so one of the things that I did was I did a community-based participatory study in Omaha that just came out of the field this summer. And the goal of this, and so I should say that, you know, this is probably easily the hardest part of my career that I've ever had to engage in. I was trained as a demographer. I am not trained to do like going into the community and collecting my own data. You know, I go and I run regression models. I look at numbers. So um, this was really an interesting way for me to approach this idea because I really wanted to get into the community ask specific questions, things that I wanted to know, but also collect these biological markers of stress and health um, in the population. And so I targeted my sample to, um, because I wanted to take, clean out the noise around socioeconomic status. So I started the study with targeting specifically low-income African-American and Caucasian mothers with a focal child between the ages of 10 and 14, because I wanted the kids to be old enough to actually be able to talk about their own experiences with stress and stressful life events. And so the purpose of my study was to explore how stress is related to health outcomes in mothers and their children. I also wanted to assess whether there are differences in stress across black and white mothers and their children. So full disclosure though, it's really, really hard <laughs> to collect data on poor white people. Um, I was not able to get a lot of um, Caucasians into my sample, um, but what the few that I did get, so I can't actually stratify these results by race. I won't be able to talk about it that way. But what it did do was I, I was able to collect a nice sam size sample of biracial children in my study. Um, and so in addition to that, I also used this as an opportunity to provide services to a disadvantaged community members in Omaha. Um, this is, uh, so I actually did, we did free health screenings for the moms who participated, moms and kids who participated in the study, and we gave them up to $75 in Walmart gift certificates. And so it may be hard to see with the lights on, but um, I wanted to show you a map of Omaha. Now, Omaha is an interesting population, um, an interesting city because it's actually very, it's hyper segregated. So these blue pixels, if you can see, these blue pixels are Caucasian, right? So it's a predominantly white, but in this corner here, these green pixels are African American. So basically, if you want to find black folks, you go up to North Omaha. That's where they're at in North O. Um, in addition, so the orange pixels are Mexican and Mexican Americans down here, and the little red dots here are refugee populations in Omaha. Okay, so it is a very interesting city um, and incredibly, in, in, incredibly diverse. And so I went into this community, I went into Omaha and started really ultimately focusing on Northo um, and collecting data there. And of course, this was a team effort. Um, granted, you know. It, the money came from NI, NICHD to me. Um, I could not have done this you know, without having an amazing group of undergraduate and graduate research assistants. This is us at a Juneteenth picnic. Um, we were out trying to recruit people and advertise for the study. 
Um, I also had amazing community partners. And so I did these in, a, in the context of health fairs. And so right here, this woman here is Miss Carolyn Green. Um, Miss Carolyn is the health director of Girls Incorporated in Omaha, which targets helping um, girls, young girls, learning life skills and stuff. It's really a phenomenal program. And so Miss CT, or um, Miss Carolyn, allowed us to use her space, which is actually a converted high, old high school school for these health fairs. And so she helped with advertising. She's an institution in the community and an advocate for North Omaha. And so having her on board was extremely important. And remember, I'm an outsider coming from Lincoln. I'm not actually even in Omaha. And so to have her endorsement was hugely important for me to get this work done. I also had, um, this is a DJ from the urban radio station who he actually is a local celebrity in the community and has a show that comes on on Sunday mornings as people are going to church that's actually targeting at-risk populations and talking to kids about sex, violence, drugs, suicide, all kinds of health, all kinds of different issues. And so he was actually incredibly in um, instrumental in helping to get people to come in and be interested in this study. I was able to go on to a show and advertise. So this was a tremendous effort. I had no idea how much work I was going to have to put into this. Um, and it turned out to be really one of the most rewarding things that I've ever had to do. Because the un another thing that happened was a lot of these mothers said to me, thank you. I, our voices never get heard. No one really cares about what we want, you know, what's happening to us. And I really appreciate you coming in and asking us about these things. So, I mean, it was a really eye-opening experience to be able to go into the community and actually talk to folks um, about the experiences that they were having. So, in addition to survey data, traditional survey data, I collected biological markers. Um, and I should say that this is one of those things, again, that I came to kind of late in my career. I don't have a biological background, but with this grant, I've been able to do coursework in biology and physiology, endocrinology, um, and I actually processed my own blood samples and saliva samples and stuff, so I really got into all of it. And as a sociologist, um, you know, this is new. Um, so, but the, these are the markers that I collected. So the first three um, came from blood spots. Now these were minimal, minimally invasive collections and it was amazing, the kids were super excited about doing it, much more excited than the mothers were. Um, and so we just used a little lancet um, and got a, a drop of blood from them, several drops of blood. C-reactive protein was the first thing that we got. CRP um, is part of that immune and endocrine system that I talked about earlier. C-reactive protein um, comes as a substance that accumulates around inflammation in the body. Um, it's a response to infection. And so it's a way to measure um, people's level of illness and infection in their bodies, okay? And so people who have higher levels of C-reactive protein, this is one of those things that when you get blood draws done in the doctor's office, they're gonna be more likely to do the older you get is if you have high levels of it, you are at higher risk of experiencing cardiovascular disease, right? Um, Epstein-Barr antibodies, those are important because they're indications of immune function. And when we talk about, and like I said, with immunity, it's hugely important. And so Epstein-Barr is a virus that 90% of the U.S. population is infected with, but it's latent. It's latent. So it just lies dormant in our system until something happens to trigger it to come back. And when it becomes active, then there's an escalation in antibodies in response to it. And this is something that is associated with uh, mononucleosis, is the most common illness associated with Epstein-Barr. And so Epstein-Barr, we looked at for that immune function process. And when people get stressed and they have elevated levels of cortisol, this is when Epstein-Barr can become active again. Hemoglobin A1C is part of that endocrine system. That is an indicator of how much blood sugar or glycated hemoglobin you have in your system over a six month period of time. This can be used as a screener for um, diabetes. And so we were able to give diabetes screenings to these moms through this hemoglobin A1C measure. Um, and so these were the three blood spots. Cortisol, we measured through saliva, and we actually had moms and kids send in their saliva samples to us. So we taught them how to do it, sent them home with a package and said, put your spit, you know, get your little um, pieces of cotton, chew on them until they're really disgusting, put them in a tube, and freeze them, and then send them to us. And we got amazing response rates. It was really quite surprising. We had like a 70% response rate for these moms and kids of actually sending this in. Um, and so finally we got, we collected blood pressure from the moms and the kids, as well as height, weight, and waist circumference from the moms and the children. So 
we asked questions about discrimination among a ton of other questions. Um, and we used William's Everyday Discrimination Scale and we adapted it for moms and for kids. And so for the moms and the kids, we asked questions like, um, have you ever been called names or been insulted? Have you ever been harassed by the police? Do people follow you around in stores? Um, for the kids, we asked questions about how the teachers treat them. Um, whether they act like they're afraid of you, whether they treat you with less respect. Um, and so these are just samples of what was a long battery of questions we asked them about discrimination. Okay, and so these were the things, and so when I show you these results, I'm showing you um, the associations between this discrimination scale and the health outcomes of interest for the moms and the kids. Okay, so in terms of hypotheses, so I had a few hypotheses that I was working with for this. Um, I wanted to start immediately as soon as the data came in. The one thing I wanted to look at was discrimination. I wanted immediately to understand is what's going on with this and is there, are there any patterns in my particular sample? And so for the moms, um, the assumption is that experiencing and perceiving discrimination is going to be associated with um, worse health indicators for, for the mothers. So what I found was there's a battery of health outcomes that I looked at, but also things that are correlated with those health outcomes, including sleep, stress, loneliness, and self-esteem. Now, these were the four outcomes that were associated with moms, um, with moms' reports of discrimination. So I was surprised because I actually expected to find that they were gonna be associated with the biological markers and some of the self-reported health outcomes. But what I found was that they were associated with the correlates of health. Uh, outcomes, right? So people who uh, have problems with sleep, that's associated with cardiovascular disease, as is reporting that you're chronically stressed out, which is different from biologically measuring stress. It's about people's feelings about being stressed out. Um, loneliness, which is associated with mortality and cardiovascular disease risk. Um, people who reported more levels of discrimination had um, reported more loneliness. And self-esteem, which is a psychosocial indicator. And so what I imagine might be happening here um, is that these are mediators potentially, right? These are pathways to health out, poor health outcomes for the moms. So while there's not a direct relationship between discrimination um, and health for these moms and kids, this could be a pathway through which if we looked at over time, the health, poor health outcomes could be manifesting. Now what's also important to know about this is again, this is a low income sample of mothers. And so there might be stressors that aren't associated necessarily with discrimination that are contributing to poor health for moms that I'm not actually getting at here, right? And so I think later one of the things I'm gonna do is look more deeply into what are these other stressors that might be predicting poor health outcomes for the moms. I also, because I'm interested in this intergenerational transmission component, um, was interested in the diffusion of poor, of like poor health and discrimination patterns. And so does mom's discrimination affect her child's health? And does child's discrimination affect mom's health? And so I really was interested in whether their patterns of experience actually affected each other. And again, keep in mind, these are 10 to 14 year old kids um, that we're looking at here in a low income population. And so I was really surprised and disappointed to find no evidence of this hypothesis in this sample. So I was shocked. I actually thought that I would see all kinds of um, kind of interactions between the moms and the kids. But in this sample, I actually found no evidence that supported this. I wonder though, if I were to look at a larger, more economically diverse population, if I would actually see evidence of this crossover effect more clearly, just because the experiences of discrimination are going to be probably more frequent for people in the middle class just because their exposure to people who are not like them is going to be more common, right? So if you're in the middle class, you're gonna be more likely to work in jobs that are predominantly white, which means you're more likely to be at risk of experiencing racial microaggressions over the course of the day-to-day -day life, um, which could potentially end up, they could maybe change these pathways. I don't actually know yet. And so finally, I looked at adolescence experience, so adolescent discrimination experience and whether those are associated with worse health. Now what I found here was actually deeply troubling. So these are the results, this is just a sample of the results here of the outcomes for perceived discrimination. Um, so these first panels, A and B, these are, I'm giving you the standardized beta coefficients adjusted for a few different variables. And this is systolic and diastolic blood pressure. For these 10 to 14 year olds, discrimination is positively associated with higher blood pressure. 
Now, again, remember I said high blood pressure over extended period of times can be extremely damaging and harmful um, to the cardiovascular system. And so these kids are already showing, and mo the majority of these kids are experiencing some sort of discrimination. They're reporting some sort of discrimination, and this is associated with elevated blood pressure. Um, this is also the case for C-reactive protein, which to my knowledge, we, there's not been anybody who's been able to show at ages this young that discrimination is associated with inflammation, systemic inflammation. And so these are kids that are this young that are reporting this kind of, and I threw out kids with acute infections. And so this is without the outliers. These kids are experiencing chronic levels of inflammation that I could not control away. Like, so this is really um, deeply troubling that we're finding these kinds of results in kids this young. Um, I also put in here loneliness because, again, I actually have a study where I looked at loneliness in adolescence and how that's related to indicators of cardiovascular disease risk in early adulthood and found that it is associated with that. And so I wanted to look at it. I show you this here because loneliness and perceived discrimination are positively correlated with one another. So in addition to these variables that I looked at, Discrimination in the kids is also associated with their self-rated health. It's associated with somatic complaints, which include headache, nausea, stomach aches, things of that nature. It's related to their depressive symptoms, behavior problems, levels of feelings of integration, social integration, and self-esteem. And so I argue that I'm actually able to show evidence here that discrimination is a proximate determinant of these kids' health. So at an early, early age, we're seeing proximately that it's not some other pathway through which discrimination is affecting their health. It's that discrimination directly is associated with these kids' health outcomes. What's important about this? Well, if you think about the fact that um, certain groups already start at a disadvantage in terms of poor health, like so from in utero. So some of you may have read the article that where I talk about um, the risk of discrimination and the harmful effects of discrimination from in utero. So the stress of discrimination on mothers can lead to detrimental effects on the kids' trajectories of health before they're even born. And so if you think about the fact that kids are born into this kind of disadvantage in health um, because of structural inequality for the mom's experience, and then you add discrimination that the kids experience on top of that, what that means for exacerbating their health risks, then you end up with this really alarming rate of health um, trajectory problems with health trajectories for these kids um, up into later life. And so I think that it's really important when we start thinking, when we think about discrimination and about health disparities, that we really keep in mind that it's not just about services. It's about these interactions that people are having at the structural down to the interpersonal level that actually are literally being embodied and getting under people's skin and making them sick. And so, you know, the summary ultimately is that discrimination is not necessarily in this small sample a significant predictor of mother's health, but these other correlates are actually, they hold up and they're supported in the larger literature around the harmful effects of discrimination on adults. Um, now, while I didn't find a crossover effect, I do, I do believe that a crossover effect exists, but it may just be de um, depend on unique situations that people are in. And also keep in mind, these are 10 to 14 year old kids, and so their own social experiences might take precedence at this point over the interactions that they have with their, with their moms, right? Because the shift developmentally is to the effects that other kids are having on, their, um, on them as opposed to the parents, although parents are still salient. I have have um, papers that show that, but not in this sample. And finally, offspring health disparities are strong predictors of, um, um, are predicted by perceived discrimination. So this is hugely important. I think that this is probably the most important finding um, from this particular study that I'm going to try to move forward um, in talking about. And so when thinking about what's important about this, um, kind of a big picture, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the direction that we're going in as a country and what this means for trajectories of health for minorities. Okay. So, <laughs> um, this begs the question, um, is, is racism back? And when I say back, I don't mean in terms of it ever went away, but I mean in terms of people's comfort with racism. Right? And so this is 
um, geocoded tweets in the United States, and this was um, by a group of students in California, and they looked at it across a bunch of different race ethnic groups, right? So they looked at it, um, Asian Americans, they looked at it um, for Latinos. Um, so they looked at all these different American Indians, but the most extreme example, and I should say, so this is controlling for any sort of kind of using the word with, um, you know, in some sort of endearing way or whatever. This is just specifically using the word nigger in a derogatory way. Um, and this was coded over a six month period between 2012 and 2013. And if you see here, Twitter does not lie. People say that, oh, we have this decline in racism or whatever. This is telling us that people's comfort with calling people hateful words, referring to a group, is endemic all over the United States, right? Um, this is in 2012, okay? And so when we see something like this, what are the implications um, for the health of the group that's being targeted when these kinds of, um, when we see this kind of stuff happening, right? Okay, there's also an increasing, dis um, there's an increasing comfort, right, with racist imagery um, people dressing up in blackface, um, the devaluing of black life, right? And so part of it is um, the media and coverage in the media, right? We see more of it. But also, I, argue, I would argue that it is comfort and thinking that it's okay to engage in this kind of behavior. And it's becoming more and more common. Now, when we look at these kinds of images, right? Um, and again, this is like a politician who circulated this um, about President Obama, all right? So we see these kinds of images, and the question becomes, are people becoming more racist? Well, like I said, I don't know that this is actually the case. When we look at psychiatric literature about implicit bias, right, and implicit bias is the idea that people may subconsciously attach value in, to different categories. So like they may attach more negative connotations to blackness than they do to whiteness or to being Latino, right? So they come with this kind of baggage that's implicit and kind of subconscious, right? And so if, in fact, racism was on the rise, then we would expect to see that implicit bias was changing in the population. Well, this is not what we're finding. It's that racism has always been there, but people's willingness to just be open about it is what might be changing. This is an experiment that looks at implicit bias, and you may not be able to see the gray line. The gray line is coverage of President Obama um, over from 2006 to 2009. This black line is implicit bias. Um, people's associations of blackness, um, the attitudes towards blackness over time. And we see that even as this coverage of Obama has, cha has changed and increased over time, implicit bias around blackness has not changed. Right? That has stayed the same. So levels of racism in the population actually is the same. So interestingly, hate groups, there's been an increase in hate groups, but it started to plateau. Um, but I would argue that even though that particular behavior has plateaued, what has changed is we've got this rise in, like, so we have the Tea Party, right? So they would argue that they're not a hate group. They would say that they're patriots, right? So these are people that are about policies. Um, they're about lower taxes, less government, these sorts of things. But what they've created through this Tea Party is another safe space for people to be blatantly and overtly racist, right? So we have these images, and there were no shortage of images online like this, um, the, of racist imagery that's affiliated with the Tea Party. Um, and so when we see this kind of comfort level of patriots, this actually is in line with the increase, this enormous increase in patriot and militia groups. Now, you can't see these dates here, but this is actually 2008 right here. What do we know about 2008? That's the year that Obama was elected the first time. See how this jump in these patriot and militia groups? This is actually, I, th I would argue, the space where people are feeling like it's comfortable, it is a safe forum, public forum, for them to be racist, right? This falls in line with like these militia groups like the Minutemen that are on the borders that we see, um, these hate groups that are on the rise in border towns um, and in communities that are anti-immigrant, right? So these kinds of um, issues are going on. And when you think about what this means for people's constant levels of vigilance and their levels feels, 
feelings of threat and fear. This has real effects when we talk about this fight or flight response in the long term. And so then we have this kind of comfort with uh, the safety, the you know, kind of threat against threat of violence against African Americans, um, killing with impunity at this point, right? And so we've got all of these examples, and it feels like they just keep coming, right? So Trayvon Martin being the most um, uh, the most popular, um, I mean, the one that we know the most about. But then there's Jonathan Farrell, who had a car accident, knocked on the door in a white neighborhood. Um, white woman answers the door, thinks he's a burglar, slams the door. He's bloody and disoriented. Um, she calls the police, and the police come, and they shoot him 10 times. He's unarmed. Then we have Renisha McBride, um, who also had a car accident, just happened to be unlucky enough to have it in a white neighborhood, goes to someone's door um, in Dearborn, Michigan, and the man shoots her in the face with a shotgun. Um, he was actually charged with murder, but very we have seen where people have been charged and been able to get away with it. We see these kinds of things, and what this, the implications of this right, for the long term. We think about this in terms of children, right? What does this mean when they are experiencing or seeing the devaluation of their lives based on the group that they're in? Um, what does this mean when we see, you know, among American Indian groups and Latino groups, seeing that they're treated less than human, what are the implications of this kind of internalization of that for their health outcomes? I mean, this can be hugely important. In addition, we have structural inequalities as well, right? So we've got, now we're seeing structural, literal policy marginalization of people of color, right? This is restrictive voting legislation just in 2013, um, where all of these red and pink colors here, and even gray, is all of the restrictive voting laws that are going, uh, trying to be pushed through or have gone through that are purposely marginalizing people of, co people of color and other groups. And so again, leading to these kinds of pathways that impact people's health. Um, and then finally, we have what's interesting to me is the, the racialization of policy, which is, seems pretty new to a certain extent, which is associating a policy that's supposed to be, you know, health care for everybody should be a pretty innocuous thing, but it actually has become this politically charged, racially charged um, discussion. And so um, this really fascinating study by a political scientist named Tesler looks at the correlations between Republican Party identification and old-fashioned racism among white Americans. And they look at old-fashioned um, racism as agreement with um, or being OK with black-white interracial relationships, right? And what they show here is that in 2006, you know, party affiliation wasn't really associated with um, approval of inter interracial dating. After Obama was elected, though, um, there was this um, enormous jump in the probability of, of being a Republican and disagreeing or disapproving of interracial dating. Um, we see on this panel here, in 2006, agreement with interracial dating was not associated with the prob probability of voting for a Democratic candidate. In 2010, however, people who disagreed with interracial dating were much more likely to less likely to vote Democrat, right? So we see this change. What's fascinating about this is the fact that when you control for Obama being the president in 2010, that effect goes away. So the effect itself literally is the black president that's created this shift in people's attitudes. And so it's literally like, um, so it's really, it was a really fascinating perspective to look at this kind of shift that we see happening around people's comfort with racism. This is also true, this is, um, an exper um, this is actually also part of Tesla's paper, where he looks at vignettes, he does an experiment where he associates um, health care with either a white presidential candidate, President Clinton, who the, um, versus Obama's. And so we know that these are very similar, these are very similar policies that were proposed. And did it uh, with the association with resentment and with stereotype coefficients. And so people with the highest levels of resentment were more likely um, to have less favorable opinions of the policies. And this was also true with stereotypes. If they had more black stereotypes, they were much less likely to favorably, to, uh, favorably support uh, health care reform. So I give you all this information to say that we see from like the macro to the micro level structurally um, that this has enormous implications for, for people of color, right? So this can have implications in terms of their ability for their life chances. 
This can have implications for their feelings of safety, their feelings of social cohesion, of support in the community. Now, this can have implications all the way down to the biolog biological molecular level. And so what I'm hoping to do in the next few years is to actually expand on this work that I did on my pilot, but to look at larger, at a much more diverse population. So looking at bringing in Latino, um, Latinos, bringing in refugee populations, trying to understand what it is to be exist embedded in these larger scale systems where we experience structural inequality, um, these macro level down to micro level to um, just over the life course developmentally, what the implications are of these kinds of experiences. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping to do in addition to stress markers is looking at neural imaging, right? So one of the things that we know about um, social exclusion is that it can literally change the function of the brain. And so we want to be able to look like I have a team that I'm working with at Nebraska where we're actually going to try to understand, look at what happens when people feel like they're being discriminated against. What literally happens to the brain when this is happening? So collecting biomarkers from them, but then also putting a subsample of people in the study in an fMRI, um, doing an experiment, inducing the feelings of discrimination, and seeing what literally is happening to them at a neural level. Um, and so trying to understand all of these different, at all of these different levels, what is happening to people when they're experiencing unfair treatment. And so now I give you all of this, and I know it's really depressing, but I mean, there's a light at the end of the tunnel with this. And one of the things that I think is great is the fact that now we're starting to see with this growing num level of research that we're, getting, we're showing concrete effects on people's health for discrimination, right? So for a long time, we've talked about it. You can talk about it in terms of policy. You can talk about it in terms of education and these sorts of things. We've never really been able to specifically, other than through healthcare, link this to health outcomes specifically. And now we can actually say that literally Literally, discrimination down to a biological cellular level is having an effect on people's health. We are embodying this experience, and so I think that that is hugely important. What it also means, and actually the president yesterday in his speech mentioned discrimination and actually acknowledged that we need to be um, recognizing that these anti-discrimination laws, we need them, which is great because I think there's an opportunity for dialogue here, right? If we're able to show this concrete evidence of discrimination affecting people's health, then we can begin to start targeting targeting policies that can affect this racism um, explicitly and not just through colorblind policy, like some of the policy we've seen around poverty, but actually, again, to start really thinking about how we can, not, how we can alleviate these kinds of oppressive situations for people of color. And so I think that that's basically it, but I need to take a moment first. This is a quote that I put in here because I needed to feel uplifted at the end, too. So um, from Martin Luther King, and he says that I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become reality. It's complicated, but who knows if it'll happen. It's important, though. And I have to acknowledge um, my funders, of course, as well as the community members, graduate research assistants, undergraduate research assistants, and my amazing study participants. So thank you for bearing with me. Incredibly powerful talk, was it not? So just a couple quick announcements to get out of the way. If you didn't catch it on your phone, UNM's gonna shut down at two if you haven't got the update yet because of the weather. So how much pool Dr. Goosby has? The president literally called me. He said, Gabe, you know, we have the speaker. How's it going? I said, it's amazing. He said, then we'll let it continue till 2, and then we'll <laughs> shut down the university. <laughs> so for, for those of you, however, that were planning to go to the Jonathan Mann lecture, they, they sent me a text and said, because of the weather, their speaker coming in from Washington State didn't get here. So their, their event this evening, if you were planning to go, was canceled. They'll reschedule for the spring. Just a, a couple of quick notes to get those out of the way. Though, if you haven't been to an RWJ Center talk before, how we handle Q&A is we begin um, with what we call initial brief discussions. It's typically one of our graduate fellows, our PhD students, and one of our faculty members starts the Q&A session with their questions, and then we open it up to the, the broader audience for, for questions for that. So I believe uh, Shannon Sanchez-Youngman is our, our IBD from the, the fellow side of it, so you can go ahead and kick things off. You have to speak into the mic for it to catch on the, the video. Okay, we want to thank, can everyone hear me? It's just for the camera. Okay, okay, can everyone hear me loud and clear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Goosby, we want to thank you for a really um, 
not so much an uplifting talk, but um, a really important talk. And you know, your work really skillfully elucidates the mechanisms um, that lead to poor health outcomes, and we really appreciate your research. Um, the fellows and I have two questions for you. And the first is related to your um, specific study on discrimination. Have you thought about conducting future research um, that might consider or elucidate the protective factors that may actually buffer the deleterious um, effects of discrimination, um, number one? Mm -hmm. And number two, on a more macro level, what kind of policy research do you recommend um, on structural and institutional changes that could prevent that could prevent these risky exposures in the first place. You ended your talk um, speaking a lot about the escalation of racism in our country. And so I'm wondering what policy recommendations you have. Um, it's sort of interesting when you cite the political science study that links these um, that links more racism due to the election of Obama. So what's the policy implication there? Um, it, it, it seems to say that his, um, his presidency has actually ignited more racism. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about that um, um, some more. Wow, these are great questions. And I don't know if I'm going to have a satisfactory answer for you. But uh, for the first question, I absolutely am interested in resilience. Because that's one of the things that I, now I couldn't really get to that in this particular pilot because it was a small pilot. But one of the things I do want to do is look more at what are the characteristics of young people and of families who aren't as deleteriously affected by discrimination. And so asking about people's experiences, you know, because I think one of the things that can happen is some people just don't even internalize it, right? So who are the people that don't even internalize racism at all? Like, what kinds of people are like that? Um, you know, some might argue that, you know, really conservative people who don't actually acknowledge that racism is an issue, you know, I would say that probably Clarence Thomas is remarkably resilient. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, really, like I think that, you know, in terms of what affects or deeply internally affects people um, in terms of discrimination is going to be really important in terms of understanding who are the people um, who are resilient. It doesn't necessarily mean, though, I mean, because there are people who do recognize and experience it, but for whatever reason, they don't have the same reactivity level that others do. And so this is one of those questions that we don't really have an answer to, but that we're trying to, we're going to need to dig a lot deeper into this, because this is actually a fairly new um, kind of per way to pursue the study of discrimination is trying to understand and dig deeper into what is it about the people who are resilient and how can we, you know, replicate the resilience of those different of those people um, and folks that might be more reactive. Now, in terms of policy, I think one of the things that's interesting is that, you know. When we had like increases in policy around civil rights, right? Um, one of the shifts that happened with the transition um, into race-specific policies was that there was, at a collective level, um, an, an appall people appalled, right, with unfair treatment. Like it got it escalated so high that people were just like, "This is completely unacceptable, and we have to make major structural changes in order to address these kinds of issues." Um, I wonder, in terms of policy, like. This is where I struggle, right, in terms of what do we do with policy? What, how is this going to work? Because I think the first step is actually acknowledging that, you know, this is still an issue and that it still exists, and which is why I'm excited that Obama actually acknowledged this. And it's not clear to me, policy-wise, I think what we need to see is at the policy level one, policymakers being more vocal about acknowledging that it exists, right? Before we can begin to start having productive conversations about what kinds of policies that we can use to change this, to actually begin to see more people having a dialogue about the unacceptable nature of this overt racism that has decided to come out into the open. Because again, I don't think racism itself has changed. I think people's willingness um, to talk about it in offensive and overt ways that are harmful to the groups that they're targeting is what's changing. And if we can, at a, at a structural level, figure out ways, you know, so like worker protections, anti-discriminatory um, laws, instead of weakening those laws, escalating those laws. If we can figure out, you know, obviously, 
um, affirmative action was a great is a great thing, but clearly the way it's only a band aid to the issue of changing people's attitudes, and it's not clear to me. Honestly, this is one of those things that I'm really trying to work through: is what we do in terms of policy. Do we publicly shame people? We can't have that be a policy, right? Um, you know, but trying to figure out how we can change. The <laughs> I mean, we can still do that. Right? I mean, we can publicly shame. And I think that one of the jobs here is that not just putting the onus on minorities to do it, but having people who are allies to also be part of this process. This is a shift in social norms um, is going to be one of the shifts that needs to happen in concert with policy. And so, you know, this is a kind of a long term issue. And this was an issue that was never really resolved. But now this is kind of the impetus for us to move forward and trying to figure that out. And I know I probably didn't even answer your question. But it's one of these things that I've been grappling with um, as I've worked on it. And so you know, that's kind of what I'm thinking. So real, real quick follow up. Unfortunately, that descriptive representation of minority elected officials correlates in a lot of ways. We found looking at anti-immigrant laws. Mm -hmm. As the percentage of Hispanics in the state legislature increase, you see an increase in the number of anti-immigrant laws. Mm -hmm. Students, it's that same trend. Mm -hmm. So our next um, IPD initial brief discussion is Dr. Nancy Lopez from the Sociology Department here at UNM. She also is the recruitment coordinator for our fellowship program. I'll note any students in here, if you're thinking about graduate school, you like this content, this type of racial and ethnic health disparity research, we provide very generous fellowships for students that want to do that. The deadline, Nancy, is? The 15th of January, and you just go to healthpolicy.unm.edu, and all the information is there. So Dr. Goosby, I, I really enjoyed your talk. I am really enjoying getting my feet wet with health disparities work as someone who previously did a lot of work on um, education inequality. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the conceptualization of race in all of these studies, um, you kind of started talking about the Clark model, the biophysical, physiological model of racism as a stressor, and then you talked about Massey and his focus on um, residential segregation. In many ways, they're in conversation with each other in that they are defining race as more than a micro-level phenomena. They're looking at the meso levels, you know, structural um, institutional dynamics. So I'm wondering to what degree um, you are conceptualizing of race as a multi-level phenomenon. My fear is, and we recently had a health disparities um, conference in September, that focusing on things like micro-level microaggressions really does not pay attention to the structural origins. And I actually ended my talk, which was called Contextualizing Lived Race Gender and the Racialized um, Gender Social Determinants of Health, which is actually in an edited volume called Mapping Race, Critical Approaches to Health Disparities Research, by saying, I, I do recognize the value of understanding micro-level racist aggressions, you know, the N-word, you name it, I've been called it, et cetera, but that the focus on that might detract from the more fundamental causes that have to do with racialized and gendered oppression that happens at the level of school tracking, at the level of residential segregation, at the level of what uh, you've described so eloquently with Trayvon Martin, that it takes um, focus away from looking at the larger macro and meso level. And certainly that's not to deny that there's a biological pathway. Um, and then my second question was also related to how a lot of the work now that's being funded through the National Institutes of Health is very much focused on looking at biomarkers, genetics, et cetera, et cetera, and how that might be what Troy Duster refers to as a backdoor to genetics, really, again, focusing on the micro. So I'm sure you're familiar with all of these debates, and I'm, I'm wondering how you're thinking about these things. Also, fabulous questions. Thank yeah, you. Nancy, right? <laughs> so, um, in terms of the first question um, and the focus of the question, so I will definitely clarify that I don't take anything away from the structural level because what I'm talking about is the embeddedness of the microaggressions within these larger structural levels and saying this is a piece in the puzzle that we haven't actually really looked that closely at which can actually contribute to these health disparities that we're seeing. So we know that there are these structural level um, 
um, issues that are always going, that are there, right, that we know are constant. We know that um, in terms of race and the intersections of race, class, and gender, that there are these explicit types of oppressions that happen that are related to our occupation of those different roles, right? And it, the implication also is whether, how we identify within the occupation of those roles. And so it's really complicated um, in terms of trying to figure out the balance between saying we know that, you know, because of people, so African American males, for example, are more likely to be tracked, right? They're more likely to be treated a certain way in the classroom. We know that, you know, certain groups are more likely to be treated in certain ways. They're less likely to get jobs, um, certain types of positions. Um, you know, minority faculty are less likely to get tenure, right? So we've got all of these different structural components here that lead to limited life chances for certain groups. Now, all I'm saying is that hey, people, in addition to this, I don't want to take away from the structural component, but I want to say that in addition to this, we see at these um, individual levels, right, that they make a contribution as well um, on top of that. Because, you know, and where I really came to the microaggressions was because in my own experience of walking into the classroom, I was telling the graduate students today, and I'm sure that you, you could testify to this too, like, the stress of walking into a classroom and feeling like you're not actually being respected, like your PhD does not, is not valued. I literally would get sick walking into the classroom. I would have stomach aches. I walked around with a migraine for two years, my first year as a faculty at the University of Nebraska. Walking into a predominantly white room and having students basically tell me that, you know, and in emails that, you know, I'm not qualified to teach this class. And it's like, wait a minute. Since, you know, um, and so I think that understanding, you know, our embeddedness in these structures and how it moves us in these different pathways in our health, and then being able to acknowledge that it's not just the structure, it's about these interpersonal interactions that also shape the experiences that people have. I think that together, synergistically, if we can have a dialogue about all of these interactions, I think that that actually is really beneficial because it can humanize what we see at the structural level, down to that indiv individual level. Because I think sometimes we talk about the big picture and people just get caught up in that. Now, the other danger I understand, you know, this whole the context in terms of just you know, kind of zeroing in to, on that micro level down to the molecular level. I, you know, and I, I'm a huge fan of Troy Duster. I think that he is just, was so prescient in the work that he was doing so early on, right? Um, in terms of kind of going down to that micro level. I think that why it's important for, um, scholarship to actually look at, you know, what it means at the molecular level though, is not to say, um, the beauty of what we're doing now is we're approaching biology in a different way, which I think is super exciting because what we're able to say now is that structural inequality, the thing that sociologists are experts at in anyway, right? This is our thing. This is our bread and butter, talking about stratification and what that means for people's outcomes, right? We're able to say down to people's actual physical beings, this affects them. This affects them on a down to a molecular level. This is hugely important because, you know, people can say, well, you know, we talk about it and we can talk about it in the abstract. But for those people that are kind of hard scientists, we can now say that we can objectively measure what this is doing to people. And so I think for folks at NIH, they're excited because, you know, self-rated health is one thing, but to be able to say that it's altering people's biology is a whole other thing. And so as long as we have people that can talk really loud and strenuously, particularly in the social sciences, about no, this is not about racial determinism. This is not about certain groups being inherently different from other groups. This is about the experiences that people have related to the group that they are members of that shapes their biology. This is a different way of talking about biology, and this is the way we need to be talking about it instead of reducing it down to, oh, this group is inherently different, or, you know, and so I think that that's where, you know, we really have to spend that time, is trying to make it clear, because, you know, there, have pe there are these MDs and stuff that will misconstrue it and say, huh, well, why is it that black girls don't lose weight at the same rate that white girls do? Clearly, it's because they just have different, they're innately different in some way, and they can't, their metabolism is different. So we just need to restrict more of their calories than we do white girls. Instead of saying, what is it about 
the middle class African American female experience as opposed to the middle class white Caucasian experience that leads to black, black girls being less likely to lose weight than white girls? Is there something about the experience in their environment, their environment, that is leading to them experiencing having these kinds of health issues, right? Because when we talk about stress, stress is associated with weight gain. It's associated with keeping weight on. And so it could literally be the stress that these girls are experiencing um, as African-American females is creating, is shifting their own, their actual biology in a way that, you know, as MDs, they don't know, right? They just, they just immediately go to a more race-specific argument. And so this is the kind of thing that I'm fighting against and why I get really well, just like fired up about it, because I'm like, no. <laughs> this is not what's going on here. Um, and so I think that if we can find a way to create that balance, always somebody's going to always try to misconstrue stuff. But we, you know, I think it's our job as scholars you know, who can help hopefully to influence policy um, that we have these kinds of debates. So at this point, we'll open it up for full audience participation in Q&A. Yes, sir, in the back. I'll run with the mic. And again, this is just for the camera, so your voice still has to carry. Okay, my name is Daniel. I'm from the Language Literacy and Social Cultural Studies, uh, a PhD student. A very be beautiful presentation, and uh, my observation is these are uh, very good. We have policy statement, and we also talk about dialogue. I'm also worried about what's happening within the community that is uh, being marginalized. Uh, in terms of self-reflection and the agencies that are available to them to actually pursue their cases. Sometimes we always look outward, but we have to start the revolution from within our house. Charity, the cell begins uh, at home. I don't know if there is any kind of agency within those community that you actually investigated. Thanks. Well, in terms of the specific communities in, um, in Omaha, what I've done is, so after, since I have this work done, um, I've made sure to let them know that I'm part of the community now, and so I'm always going to come back. One of the things I'm doing with data collection um, is actually I'm going to go back to Omaha, start presenting this work in North Omaha. Um, they've got community, um, North Omaha Community Care Council, South Omaha Community Care Council. They've got community leadership um, and collectives that are parts of community-based organizations that help kind of galvanize the communities. And so I'll be going and um, giving information to them about these findings. Um, also, I'm going to be presenting that information to DHHS in Omaha. Um, I don't, you know, and maybe there might be a way for them to start looking at programming options um, in these communities. But I want to get people in the community on board and have them thinking about what are the things that we can do in our own communities to try to figure out how to provide that kind of agency within the group um, to see if they can start to push change, but also kind of putting these, you know, at the structural level, putting people on blast. Um, so, because one of the problems I had in Omaha was that they did not, um, I could not collect data through the schools. Omaha is notoriously resistant to researching in the schools, which means that in the most diverse school district in, in the state of Nebraska, they have no systematic information on health outcomes for the kids, um, and that is criminal. And so, you know, this is one of those things where I've got tenure now. So if I want to go in there and talk crazy about people, I can do that <laughs> in the hopes that we can start to have some sort of productive dialogue around change in the community there. So. Thank you. Great talk. Um, and I have one comment and one question. The comment in, in, in uh, the spirit of full disclosure, I am a physician. Um, <laughs> And I'm way more riled up than you are around this genetic stuff um, because the reality is this is all epigenetics, which has nothing to do with the genome and our differences. It has everything to do with how the environment has changed the expression of those genes. So I'm with you on that. Um, the question I have is um, twofold. One is that there is a major interaction between the HPA, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and HPO, hypothalamic ovarian axis. Those two interact with each other, which actually gives women a, um, an added way to alter their immune systems, which is why they have higher autoimmune diseases. 
and in particular, Native Americans, for example, have a much higher incidence of um, lupus, as an example. And so my question is, in your data, especially with the, the youngsters in your study, did you do any sex disaggregated analysis to see whether the girls were differentially impacted compared to the boys? That's a great, great point. Um, I actually, um, the sample is like 70% female, and so like it's, it's a challenge, right? Yeah, so I have a majority females. Um, in terms of, I, so I haven't looked specifically at disaggregation, but just in terms of raw numbers, uh, we had quite a few, uh, the autoimmune disease that came up in the kids was asthma, right? So that's the one thing that's just prevalent across the board in the kids. Um, in terms of the moms, though, we did have, we had lupus. Um, there was actually MS in a kid in my sample, which, wow, 10 to 14. Um, what other autoimmune diseases did we see in the sample? Um, but yeah, lupus did come up in the mothers. We don't see it yet in the kids, in the kids though. But I think that it's important to note this uh, because I hadn't actually looked at the HPO axis in women, but I mean, yeah, no, that's a that's a great point. See, you're schooling me because you know I'm still learning. Um, I think. Got a great article from 1997. I'm happy to share. Oh, that'd be fabulous. Thank you. And so, you know, I think that again, this goes back to the occupation of different, you know, uh, different spaces, right? Um, for women, right, we're going to see we may see manifestation of illness differently. Um, the reactivity to stress may manifest itself in different ways. And so, I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind. And in the future, I'm definitely going to be more cognizant of that. And I'll look through my data actually to see what kinds of breakouts I have in that area. But yeah, I'm glad you brought up the epigenetic stuff because that's one of those things too that when we talk about genes, they're not stable. It's not about, you know, the nucleotide sequence, right? That's not, that's inalterable. But what changes is that interaction with the environment, I talked to with Jessica about this earlier today, that, that that causes that expression, right? And so you could go your entire life with not expressing a whole ton of genes, right? And so I think that this is, you know, fascinating, fascinating and important stuff. Thank you for bringing that up. Other mm -hmm. questions? Thank you for your talk, it was fabulous. And one of the things that it made me think about is that there was a time between the late 60s and the early or late 70s when health among African Americans got better. And also during that time, health in our whole country was better. And then in the 80s and on, we had all these policies because we had this colorblind view of racism uh, that really worked against people of color and also poor people. So what I'm thinking about when Shannon asked the question about research alternatives, what I'm thinking is that it would be a wonderful piece of research to track those policies that have caused the health outcomes to become worse because they tended to increase racism, but without ever talking about it. For example, we have policies about um, the um, three strikes your outlaws, um, all the policies that have to do with the imprisonment of people of color, particularly black men. And then we had policies where we changed the way that healthcare was deliver because all of a sudden uh, President Reagan discovered how much money could be made out of disease and a lot of policies ended up doing that so those are just two that I can think about and if you give me five more minutes I can probably think of a lot more so if we could track those policies so kind of go retrospectively and then think about what policies do we need to change that I think that would be a great piece of research that could really come out of what you just said. So I thank you for the inspiration. If we can look back historically and see what the policies were that were so helpful in improving health, maybe we should just go back to those policies. I mean, if they weren't broke, why, why were we trying to fix them? Um, and so I think that that's an excellent, excellent point. And I think going back historically and kind of revisiting those issues, I think might be one of the ways that we can begin to inform policy for the future. Any other questions? Uh, before, before I wrap up, then I'll, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Goosby. Fascinating talk. Very powerful. A uh, quick note that... Quick note.
Quick note that although this is our last speaker series event for this academic semester, we'll be continuing the embodiment theme with at least three speakers in the spring semester and are partnering, it looks like, with the Department of Psychiatry on February 25th. We'll be bringing Dr. Swanson from Duke University. He's an internationally known expert on mental health and guns policy. So look, February 25th, the idea will be we'll have Dr. Swanson hopefully kick off a series of events focused around mental health, guns policy, culture of guns in the West, all of that dynamic, obviously, if the RWJ Center is involved, there'll be a racial and ethnic component to those discussions. So keep an eye open for that in the spring. Thank you very much. Stay warm.